of God. Listen, we had some technical difficulties, but we're still going and we're still teaching the word tonight here at the place of worship. I want us to understand how many of us, why we dealt with these folk that God, and the reason why I believe God took it there, because sometimes we deal with people in Nineveh. Sometimes we deal with people that have been at a place that we know they were alcoholics, they were drug addicts, they, they were all kind of things that were not right before God. But yet in the same token here now, we prayed, we ministered to them, we, were, we honored God in every way that we could. And here now, God has delivered them from these things and we're upset we're mad we weren't looking for it to happen that fast we didn't realize that the moment that God sent us there and we responded to the call of God and we moved in position to be able to honor what God had said and invite them to Christ and they accepted Christ as their personal savior we saw not just the weeping and wailing of the face but we understood that that was pure conviction and that was conversion that took place because the word had already put their hearts before we got that God had already satisfied the ground he had already put them in place and position to be receptive to what he had to say. And in that, here now, Paul says, just because, Paul says, it don't matter. Paul says, how can you think that now you are above the law? Some of us feel that we are above the laws of God. Some of us feel that it does not matter. We don't have to feel remorseful. But here now, as Isaiah said in chapter 1, he said to Israel, he said to Judah, he said to the children of Israel, he said to the body, he said to those that were of the Hebrew nation, he said, look at here, God said, I got a problem. Every time you come to my house and we do this religiously every week, those of us that have worship on Fridays, those of us that have worship on Saturdays, those of us that have worship on Sunday, going to revivals, going to conferences, going to convocations, how many times you yourself, and because I've been at this place and I know what it feels like, I understand where it is to be. And you're wondering why you can't feel the spirit of God. You're wondering why it's hard for you to get into worship. And here now you're looking over because y'all go to the same church. Y'all fellowship at the same house. Y'all in the same uh, part of the ministry together. And here now you're wondering why it's so hard. And you think it's because of the person there. Have you really died to what was already bothering you because of what it was that you feel they did to offend you? Did you take the time to put into play? The word of God says in Matthew chapter 18, I believe verse 15 to verse 20, he said, if you have ought against your brother, he said, you ought to go to him. That even if it's ought against your sister, go to them. Tell them that fault between you and them. I mean, in other words, there's a private meeting that should take place that you begin to spell out to this person what it is, how it is that you feel concerning what it is that they're doing or have done and settle the matter, bring it to a resolve. When the resolution have come, now you should be back as brothers and sisters in Christ because the word of God says that if you tell them their fault. And if they hear you, in other words, if they receive what you got to say, in other words, if they accept what you got to say, in other words, if they honor what you have to say to be real, accepted and forgiveness goes on. Oh, by the way, we're saying if it's dead, it ought to be buried. I'm wondering tonight in the burying of these things that we should have buried in the liquid grave before we were raised, unforgiveness should have been buried there. And tonight, a lot of us still hold unforgiveness in our heart. I want, I want to know tonight, here it is, you coming in, and, and Isaiah said you come in for your festivals, you come in for your convocations, you come in for your conferences, you come in for Bible class, you come in for choir rehearsal. Here now you're supposed to be praising God that God would enter you or allow you to be ushered into his presence and worship, but yet you still have unclean hands, yet you still have an unclean heart, yet you still despise the fact that what God said should take place. You refuse to move back into position that God says. So Paul goes on here in the 16th verse of the 6th chapter, he's in know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness listen here tonight here now you're going to your various fellowships, your ministries that you're a part of, or the church that you belong to, that your name is on the roll, and that's where you're going, and that's where you're worshiping. But here, here's the issue. Here's the problem that come up, and you're supposed to be dead to these things. All of these things should be dead unto you. And here now, we won't allow malice to die. We won't allow ourselves to cause hatred to die. We, we won't even forgive folk for what they just did. They could have just hurt us before we walked into the church and stepped on our foot or they cut in front of us as we were getting ready to get the parking spot at the church and we we're getting ready to park there and they parked there before us and we're upset and mad. You know that's my parking spot. They sitting in the seat where we customarily sit every Sunday and instead of understanding we don't have but one place. We got one place that is definitely set for us and that is the grave. The other place that is set for us is one or the other. It's either heaven or hell 
And hell ain't a place that none of us should want to be because it's not a figment of our imagination. So if it's dead, our old thoughts should have died with it. And when we get to the house of worship, when we get to the place where we're supposed to honor God, where we're supposed to engage in prayer, where worship should have took place before we got there because we honored him in prayer at home. We honored him in praise at home and he prepared us to be able to engage and enter in. So many people are in God's house, the houses that are set aside. And there's so many houses that have been set aside as saying it is a house of worship. It is a house of God, but it's no more than a den of thieves. So what I'm asking tonight, if we really kill these things, how are we ridiculing people in church? How can we say we really before God and we are honoring the father? We, we, we're honoring Yahshua. We, 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 we're honoring Jesus Christ. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to come in, and we want the Spirit of God to be present with us. But yet, we regard animosity. We regard hatred. We regard anger. We, we regard bitterness. We, we have all of this strife against one another. We, we still can't stand the sight of sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so. I don't like reverend so-and-so because he or she, they, they still are participants in sin. If we are as spiritual as we are, then the dead part of us that died to not wanting to see them restored and brought back to a place, a right relationship and fellowship with God should have brought us to the place now that it was dead in us that we want to now take the spirituality that we say we have and as spiritual as we say we are and try to restore them, remembering that we are just as easy, susceptible to fall to the same thing. Paul says tonight in verse 17 of this sixth chapter, and I'm going to take you to some other places tonight. He says, but God. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye obeyed from the heart. Your mind completely believed. He said, thank God you, you used to. That was something you used to give in to. You, you know how easily we are swayed when people want us to hate somebody else without a cause? We, we want to be at a position where we think that we ought to be at a place to where people think that we are, are loving them so much, but we really don't care. I, I, I don't like Reverend so-and-so. I don't like Apostle such-and-such. And see, because I know what they've done. I know what they're doing. I know the place that they are. But have you taken the time to sit down and begin to minister to them in such a way that they begin to realize and recognize the conviction? Have God compelled you to go to them and say, brother, God compelled you to go to to them and say, sister, hey, listen, I understand you're preaching and God has placed an anointing. God has really, truly called you into the place. He not only called you, but he chosen you, but you still got some things that are rending you powerless because we got to remember, even though we are dead to sin, the word of God teaches us. Paul tells us, and many other writers have hinted around the fact and said that gifts come without repentance. In other words, you can be operating and exercising a gift and still have not repented before God, but the Holy Spirit, when God decides and desires to move upon you to begin to operate in that gifted will, what happens is rendered powerless and it loses power the more we stay in the sins that we have been in. The more we continue to commit the same thing, the more we continue to stay in the same place to Tonight, brothers and sisters, I want us to understand that if it's dead, it ought to be. It should be buried. 18 of the sixth chapter of Romans, Paul says, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. How many of us really go about living a righteous life? Or how many of us really go about professing how righteous we are? We speak a good righteous game. We talk about how good we are. But yet in the back of our minds and in the set sets of our heart, we're at a place that we feel and we think that it's all right to live this way because don't nobody see us. It's all right if God sees us, but we don't never decide to come out. Isaiah again, he said these words. He said, listen, y'all come, you present yourself, you're raising your hands up to me, you're saying how much you love me, you're saying how much you know that you don't deserve to be where you are, but have you come out of what you're in? Look at what Paul says to the church at Corinth in his second letter that he has recorded. He said, for the love of Christ constraining us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. He, he, this, that's, the, that, 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 that's the fifth chapter of Paul's second letter that is recorded to the church at Corinth. He said, for the love love of Christ constrained us, it pulls us, it draws, it compels us, it moves us, it helps us to remember and recognize that because of this one thing, because we thus judge that if one died, we understand that Jesus died for all and all of us are dead. In other words, here now, you're dead to sin. Sin, in other words, that death simply means it has no more power, it has no more authority. How many times we feel, and under the thing, and, and, and under the under the teaching of genotism, it, it taught that it was all right to tell 
tell a little bit of lie because a little bit of lie hurts less than telling the complete truth. But here I want us to understand that any lie is a lie, no matter whether it's big or small or whether we're trying to conserve or save a person's feelings. Let's get to the place tonight that we can be convicted enough to stop or see some lying or practice the truth a whole lot. Does the truth really hurt sometimes? Yes. Does it bring us to the place that it causes us to be angered? Yes. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, be ye angry, but sin not. God never said that you could not get angered. He never said you would not get angry. He himself got angry because of sin. How many times that we have a justified reason to be angered because we know what God have called a person to. We know what God have called them unto, but yet they continue to do the same thing and refuse to honor God in every way that they possibly can honor him in. How many of us tonight are at that place or at that position and we know that it is not good to be where we are, but yet we still see what they're doing and we know the good that they got. We know the power that lies in them. We know the anointing that rests upon them, but yet they refuse to remove themselves from sin. They refuse to bring themselves out of their sinful ways. They'd rather go on and stay drunk all the time. They'd rather go on and stay high all the time. They'd rather go on and lay up here and lay up there. They'd rather go on and feel that it's all right to do this because in the world that we live, morality and being morally correct is no more right. It's all right to be immorally correct because that's what our society says and teaches. So tonight Paul says, he says, look at here, and that he died for all that they which live should live, should live not henceforth, live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet we know, we, we yet now henceforth know we him no more. He said, look at here. He said, let me put this to you plain and simple. We followed, we saw, we know what he did in the flesh, but he died to the flesh because after the flesh, the flesh was corrupt. Although he knew no sin, yet he came in sinful flesh and died for sin, yet no longer should we live according to sinful flesh because we know him no longer after the flesh that he was in because now he's received back his glorified body. So now in these bodies in which we live, we live unto him in righteousness as his spirit empowers us so that no longer sin have power over us. He said, therefore, if any man be in Christ here now, because we died, because we buried it, because we got rid of it every day, daily, we have to die continually to the desires, to the wants, to the moving, to the prompting of what our flesh want. Paul said this to the church in Galatia chapter five. He said, if we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust thereof. Let me put it in a simple way. When he says, walk in the spirit and we won't fulfill the lust thereof. If we spend more time meditating on the word of God, if we spend more time applying the word of God, if we spend more time living out the word of God in our life, in less time paying attention to what it is that we have sinned about, how it is that we did sin, the manner in which we sinned in, then that would be less time that we will fulfill the desires of the flesh because we're spending more time being about our father's living. Not because we walk around saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God. I, no, 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 brothers and sisters, is making a simple application of what we have learned in the word and making sure that we put ourselves in position when God has shown us to be being drawn into some things or the enemy have now presented us with some things to tempt us thereby that we pull ourselves away from it because James said, let no man think when he's been tempted, he's been tempted of God for God tempted no man with sin. So we cannot say God allowed me to get into that. Although God is in control of everything, although the spirit of God is in control of everything. Although God has the control of Satan and Satan can't do nothing without God's permission, yet God himself would not bring you to the place of sin. Am I making sense tonight? He, he, didn't, he may have allowed you to be to the place that now you're in this position and you're faced with opposition, but God will give you a way of escape. Go ahead, you got something to say? How do I know this? Paul says again that God is faithful, that God loves us so much that he will give us a way of escape. So when we find ourselves in a position and we find ourselves where sin seems to be running on the rampage and taking over us so much so that we seem that we cannot seem to bear with it, don't blame God for what is taking place. Paul goes on to say, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. The moment we are converted, the moment conversion takes place, now we should be at a place and be in a position where we're receiving the word of God, being taught the word of God, applying the word of God, and making sure that we live it out every day. 
Let me put it to you this way. We spend more time worried and concerned about the fact that we had sin and concerned about how we will sin than we'll find ourselves in a position that sin will take place. But when we put ourselves in a position that we trust the God that has now brought us to salvation in Christ and Christ now lives in us and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit and we spend less time trying to stay away from sin and more time living because we are free from sin, then there's less possibility that you will go back into sin. Does that make sense? Because let me put it to you this way. If you know, if you and Bobby used to have a good relationship together and you know God had brought you out because you asked God to deliver you from that relationship because one, it may have not been in a godly manner. Two, it may have not brought honor to God. Three, it may have dishonored you in so many ways. And four, it may have put you in an emotional position where mentally and psychologically you was out of balance and you've done things that were out of your character and now God have delivered you out of it. But you know Billy know how to woo you. You know Billy know what to say. You know Billy know how to look at you. You know, Billy know how to begin to present himself to you in such a way that you just seem to melt like a piece of ice on some hot water. So here now, if you know that is the case, Paul said, rather Peter said, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separated. There are some times that you have to separate yourself from certain things that were easily drawing you into them that could easily provoke you back to sin. Paul said to this way to the Hebrew people, he said, wherefore we are compassed about with such great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that do easily beset us. Here now is the weight. We're around Billy. Here now we're around Sally. And we know they know what it is and what it takes to get our attention, what it is to bring us to the place, to put us in a position where we begin to think, we begin to reminisce, we begin to look back, we begin to talk about it, we begin to ponder on it, we begin to share how it used to be, what it used to feel like, how it sounded, the way we used to dance, where we used to eat at. We already know these things, but sometimes we got to separate ourselves enough so God can deliver us from it and remove the rest of the residue that's there that, com- that carries the familiar spirit that can easily bring us back. And here now is the weight. You know the weight of it is. Billy know what to say. Get a woo He going to do you that. Sadly going to say, you know, I got on your favorite perfume. You know, if you hang around the places that you used to easily be provoked to be pulled in and you know, they done, they done rolled up some good, they done rolled up some perp, they done rolled up some regid, they done rolled up some stank or they got that black tar that you can get and it's going to get you just right because you just lost your job. You just found yourself losing your house. Your children don't want to be bothered with you. They act in all kinds of ways and you don't know what to do. You, you can't pay the bills. You can't.